Well, it's not often I feel a bit intimidated, I must say, before an interview, but Bear Grylls, SAS, Survivor, feeling a bit edgy. The truth is, I'm good in mountains, I'm good in jungles. I'm always quite nervous in interviews. Bear Grylls has been as close to death as any human being should ever get without dying. And we're already in what they call um, the death zone. The choice between drinking camel intestinal fluids or being interviewed probingly by Piers Morgan. <laughs> Give me the camel any day. Takes a kind of guts and pass and brain. I'm coming for you, Bear. As the scouts say, be prepared, although I don't feel 100% prepared, but I'm here. It feels a bit odd seeing you sitting here, like a sort of caged animal. You're normally out there in the mountains or the jungles, fighting dangerous beasts. How I do feel you feel? Incredibly uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, it's not often I get dressed up in a suit, so it's in your honour, so here you go. <laughs> Are you prepared to answer anything, or do you feel like your defences will come up as we go into some of the more nitty-gritty areas of your life? It depends what you ask me. I mean, you know, I'll always try and be as open and honest as I can, but yes. Should I be physically afraid of your retribution? Should I press the wrong button? Depends what you ask. <laughs> Surely you know the, the, the two-inch death punch. I mean, we've got about... <laughs> I only need two inches, Piers. Should I become a threat, you are within range? Yeah. To kill me with one blow? Mm, probably not kill you, but I, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't work for a week. <laughs> <laughs> a bear is obviously your nickname. How did you get that name? I was christened Edward, um, and my sister, who's here tonight, she kind of said, oh, that's such a conventional name. So that became Ted, Teddy, Teddy Bear. Not a very butch story. Um... In 2010, you came second in a poll of public figures most admired by the middle classes. The, the poll found that you were, and I quote from them, popular with middle-class men and a substantial number of middle-class women rather fancy Bear. Good. <laughs> Do you see yourself as a bit of a sex symbol? <laughs> no, of course not. But you're obviously very fit, physically fit. Well, I'm, the truth is, I'm not a natural athlete, actually. I do go to a gym, but I work out in quite an unconventional way. Lots of kind of pull-up stuff and press-up stuff, but always in kind of spider-like, leopard-like positions. What is a leopard-like position? Well, instead of, like, doing a normal press-up, you know, I would do a press-up that, instead of like that, I'd have maybe one... One leg up, and then up. I'd alternate. You see... <laughs> You're not called Bear for nothing. Um, you like cavorting around in the nude, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I, I that's not really true. I mean, if there's a substantial body of water around and nobody's looking, I'm often quite tempted to strip off and dive in. I've got uh, three words for you. Nude <laughs> piano playing. Uh, yes, that's been known to do as well after a, you know, late night with friends on the piano. <laughs> Are you all again, naked or just you? Um, uh, we've, uh, we've all been known to be naked, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when we asked Dermot O'Leary, uh, your friend, about your love of being naked, he said you have uh, sent him and his wife a naked photograph of yourself recently. I think he, uh, he texts me going, where are you at the moment? And yeah. I send him a picture of me doing well, a sort of... let's see the picture you sent, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> what are you actually doing in that picture? Um, so this is... We own this little island in North Wales and there's a great cliff jump into the sea and I do this every morning, to be honest, when I'm up there and before anyone's out. But the thing is with this photograph, <laughs> I looked on my iPhone and when he texts, he said, where are you? And I looked fine, sent it to him. And actually, if you do blow it up, you can just see the end of what I didn't realise was visible. <laughs> so, um... <laughs> yes, that's the danger of small screens and iPhones. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you why. It is very small, I'll give you that. <laughs> well, I 
say, it was an incredibly cold winter's day <laughs> a week ago. <laughs> Bear Grylls, it's fair to say your life's been one big adventure. Half for me. And half for you. Just a taste of kind of guts and pass and brain. Bear Grylls, the world's favourite real-life action man. He's the toughest, hardest guy. I know, he's like... Mountaineer, avalanche man. He's one of those rare alpha males. The guy you'd want around when it all went pear shaped. Ex Eaton, ex SAS, posh, good looking, hard as nails. He's the real James Bond. Bear has climbed mountains, paramoted above the summit of Everest, and led expeditions in the Arctic and Antarctic. His TV programs are watched in nearly 200 different countries. It's actually quite incredible, his meteoric rise to fame. One last bit. Awesome. Bear's thirst for adventure came at a young age, and even the strict rules of Eton wouldn't stop him. He climbed onto the roof of the library, which um, is not something that you'd probably recommend that your child did if you were sending them off to, off to school. After leaving school, Bear spent three years in the military's most elite force, the SAS. Then, at the age of 23, he became one of the youngest people to climb Everest. With his dynamic action man credentials, he got picked up by a deodorant company. Facing an audience, you are on your own. There's no safety rope. It wasn't long before a TV career beckoned. We're hot, dry and miserable. But I keep saying that every step on this is a step closer to home. Bear's first starring role was one of 12 men experiencing the hardships of the French Foreign Legion. I've read the old Legion stories of men being buried alive and left in the sands of the Sahara. Experiencing it makes me think there cannot be many worse ways of dying. As the process went on, he came more to the forefront as, you know, a leader and someone to rely on and someone who has all these skills. Bear's big break as a global star came on the Discovery Channel, fronting his own survival series, teaching viewers how to stay alive in extreme conditions. That one where he ate the maggot. He ate a huge maggot and then exploded on the camera. Oh. That was just revolting. One thing you can do if you're stuck out here with no water source at all is actually drink the fluid from a fresh elephant dung. Bear took survival to another level. The Berbers could use this as an emergency shelter in a sandstorm. You don't need... You, don't, you honestly don't need to do that. Don't do it. And all I'd do is... get inside it. Pull it over, and I'll be 100% protected from the sand. Bottom line is, it doesn't matter how good or smart or clever you are, without water, you're dead. You can recycle pee to help you survive. You take your T-shirt and then just pee on it. Drinking his own urine, he's an advocate of it, you know? He's, he may as well be the kind of lead member of the Drinking Your Own Wee Society. He'll just do it. He, he just won't think about it. And that's part of his bloody, bloody-minded mentality, which gets him through. <laughs> you see, here's the thing. You really enjoy that stuff, don't you? I do come alive in those moments, but it, it's not that it tastes nice or is nice, but... You know, it's fun to kind of share techniques and skills that you know are quite edgy, but it also could save people's lives. Sleeping in a camel's carcass. What was that like? <laughs> yeah, I remember actually on that night, I was on Larium, which is this anti-malarial pill, which gives you kind of pretty wacky dreams. And I remember at one point waking up, and I actually I slept on the head. I had the head as a pillow pulled round, and I woke up, with the whiskers tickling me like that, and I was convinced in my dream this thing had come alive and actually had eaten me. <laughs> and I, was, I woke up in the middle of the day and go, ah! <laughs> um, so that was a low point. When you eat raw zebra meat, uh, or the bugs, or whatever, there must be a danger, I guess, of that meat itself, or the maggots, whatever it may be, being contaminated. 
you know, and the wild is unpredictable and, and you know, sometimes things go wrong. You know, I, I try and do things where the advice is good and if you do this, it's not going to make you sick, but sometimes it does go wrong. I mean, the worst, the worst was I remember eating this snake and I remember at the time thinking, hmm, this is a little bit dodgy, you know, and sure enough, two hours later, just feeling everything going south and you know that feeling, it was like, you know, you're not going to be able to stop this. And, I was climbing up this Namibian cliff and I was halfway up and I was thinking, I've just got to make it to the top, then we can have a break, I'll get the trousers down, we'll do it. Then I realised I wasn't going to make the top and I was with the camera guys, with Simon, and I said, just turn your camera off, this isn't going to take long. And I was holding on one hand and you know, I was trying to get, I had a foot in like this, hand like this, getting my trousers down and, you know, and, and leant out and I did diarrhoea into free oh, air like this. Oh, my God! anyone below you? Yeah, the rest of the crew. <laughs> But, um, anyway, it was fine. I pulled the trousers up. It's grilled dung, coming at high speed. But I remember then looking up, and, oh! the, and the camera just blinking. You know, this red <laughs> light, and I'm thinking, it is nothing sacred. <laughs> Let's just grab one minute. Let's go back to the beginning. You were born Edward Michael Grills in London in 1974. Your family later moved to the Isle of Wight. Your parents are Michael, a Conservative MP, and Sally. You have an older sister, Lara. You went on lots of adventures with your dad uh, when you were young. T tell me how uh, all that started. What kind of thing did you do together? Well, you know, because we were on the coast, I'd always, you know, loved the boating. We were always making rafts, you know, restoring old little putt-putt boats. Um, and then that was in the summer and in the winter we'd, we'd climb and we'd go for these things. And I go back to the cliffs now and they're tiny, you know, but at the time I felt like I was climbing the biggest mountain in the world. And, you know, it was a mix of against the elements with him and I felt braver, I think, when I was with him. And I just loved it. I, I, I think it was as much about wanting to hang out with him, actually, as it was about the climbing, because I didn't always like being scared and I was scared a lot of the time. When you were eight years old, you were sent off to boarding school to Ludgrove Prep, also Prince William's Prep School. Quite young to be, to be shipped off like that, but at the time, pretty conventional, I guess, for a family like yours. In those days, you're right, you went off and, and you didn't see your parents until the end of term. You might you'd see them at half term, but that was it. You know, you go, you know, six weeks without any contact. And it was, to be honest, at a young age, I found it really hard. And I remember seeing my dad in floods of tears, I'd be in floods of tears, my mum would be in floods of tears, and they're gone. And I think, what part of this is right? <laughs> you know, but at the time, it was definitely, definitely hard. And it's why when I had time back with them, it was like, oh, this is amazing. And then, you know, you know that, that kind of closeness to my dad was so important at that age. For your next school, which was Eton College, the finest school in the country, many, many claim. How did you fit in there? Um, at 13, if I'm honest, I was quite nervous going. It's a, a, quite an intimidating place. Were you bullied at Eton? Um, I was in the early years. And in what way? We had a guy there who, was, um, you know, who remained nameless, but he was incredibly strong and always used to get very high on, on glue. And he had this foghorn and he used to... And that was his sign that he was coming for us. And he'd walk in and we'd... I remember one time carrying him in, in, the, in the cupboard with all my clothes, you know, and hearing the door fly open, and it's like, you know, shaking in there, the door opening and just grabbing me, and, and you know, what he would just... Do? Well, he'd just th literally throw us around, I get pinned against this and just beaten up. Now, when you were in your Eton uniform, you had a run-in with some local boys in the loo at a McDonald's. Yes, gosh, amazing, you've got all these stories. We'd once a week be allowed across the bridge into Windsor and you're allowed to go to either Pizza Hut or McDonald's. And I remember, you know, being there and I went down to, to the, you know, the loos who were down this, you know, downstairs and went there, had a pee, turned around and thump, you know, there was these three big guys there and um, pushed me against the wall and um, they were then just discussing what they were going to do to me and I was like this. I was like, you know, I, I just survived getting beaten out the other side of the bridge back at school and sometimes I was like in the loos at <laughs> McDonald's thinking, I've really got to sign up for karate lessons. But uh, they pushed me against the wall and they were going, yeah, we're going to stove his head in, we're going to do that. And I was thinking, OK, I've been through worse, I'm coping with this. And then they went, no, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to shave his pubes. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I haven't got any pubes. <laughs> 
This is going to be so... Which is even worse. Exactly. I thought I could deal with the old punch and so I'm deal with that, but the humiliation <laughs> of me showing... And at that point, I thought, go hard, go fast, and I literally went, bosh, and dived in and pushed him aside, burst out the door, sprint out of there, and learned that valuable lesson that sometimes you've got to run. <laughs> now, in 1994, you decided to apply for selection to the Army's most elite force, the Special Air Service, more commonly known as the SAS. What was the hardest bit of the whole selection process? Once they've whittled the big numbers down to a handful of you, I think at that stage we were down to eight from 160-odd or whatever. And the end part of that process is a resistance to interrogation phase of it where they simulate shock of capture. You're captured by a hunter force with dogs and all of that. You're underground, you're stripped, you're naked, you're, you're handcuffed. And, you know, you know in the back of your mind this isn't real. They're not really going to rip your toenails out. But it's amazing how clever they are to mess with your mind. And then at the end of that, literally, is your badging ceremony where you're accepted in. And I remember standing in front of the commanding officer of the SAS at the time, one boot on, trousers ripped, shirt ribs, snot, blood everywhere. And, you know, just being given this Sandy Berry and a great sense of real pride, you know. And that's really, though, when the job begins. How many people have you killed? <laughs> There's some questions not to ask and not to be answered. Bear, growing up, you were determined to follow your dreams. From an early age, Bear could turn his hand to anything. Bear was one of those annoying people who was brilliant at everything. You give him a tennis racket, you could play tennis, you give him a paintbrush, you could paint. But it was climbing with his father that Bear loved most. From about seven or eight, they used to go off in the Isle of Wight and there was this cliff, um, which wasn't very high, but anything Bear could climb, he would climb. He used to have a, a picture on his bedroom wall of Mount Everest. He always had this dream, which he discussed with Dad, that he always wanted to climb Mount Everest. That dream stayed with Bear through the years. But before he could make it reality, disaster struck while on leave from the SAS in a parachute accident. He was doing something in South Africa. The chute failed and um, he hit the ground. I remember going to see him down at his parents' house when he was in bed with a broken back. And he just lay there for a long time. He was just really awful. His SAS career was in tatters. The doctors told him he wasn't going to be able to walk again. He was bedridden for, for, for several weeks, if not months. The bear had a plan. The thing that kept his mind moving and his spirits moving was this picture of Everest and the words of his father that, you know, what are you going to do? Only 18 months after his accident, Bear took on the highest peak on Earth. When he first set off, I remember his, his dad thinking it was a great idea, his mum, I suppose, as, as normal, thinking it was an absolutely mad idea. But he had a sat phone, and I remember speaking to him Quite weird. He was setting off for the final up. Um, we're already in what they call um, the death zone, which doesn't exactly inspire one with confidence. He was saying, "Can you pray for me? I'm just about to set off up this up this mountain." Led by experienced Sherpas, it would take 90 days to get to the summit. There's all sorts of your body, which, if you do get to a certain height before you die, it'll go wrong and possibly cause you a stroke or an embolism. On the 26th of May, 1998, 23-year-old Bear became one of the youngest people ever to reach the summit of Mount Everest. Fantastic. I'm absolutely delighted here. Are, are the three of you there, over? He rang us from the top of the mountain when he actually reached the top and the relief when that happened. I remember seeing he was on the front page of quite a few newspapers and going and sitting at the bus stop going, oh my gosh, that's so weird. This is this guy I've just started going out with and he's on the front there, youngest Brit to climb Everest. Bear had achieved the lifetime ambition he and his dad had dreamt of. But three years after Bear climbed Everest, his father suddenly died of a heart attack. When his dad passed away, it was just like a train crash, I think, in his chest. It was really unexpected. It was a huge shock. He withdrew into himself quite a lot and went off into quiet places to grieve on his own. He found it quite difficult to share, I think, his grief.
grief. They were so close, him and his father, really close. Bear's father called him Tiny, and Bear calls our eldest son Tiny as well. He was a real fun-loving guy, gave Bear cuddles, and that kind of soft side of Bear, I think, was really instilled in him. His father absolutely adored him, and his father was a huge support to him. It was just absolutely devastating. How did you hear that your, your dad had died? Um, God, it's amazing watching that. That's lovely old stuff. Um, I, was, I was with Shara, we lived on a boat um, on the Thames, we still do. And a policeman came and knocked at the door and... Um, <laughs> oh dear, gosh. <clears throat> Um, yeah, so, um, you know, it's funny, people always say to me, oh, you know, you make people cry on the show. And I would say it would be extraordinary to me if people didn't get emotional yeah. at, at precise yeah. moments like this. You know, this was a father that you absolutely worshipped and loved, and he did you, and to see those pictures, it, it must be emotional. Mm. I don't think there's anything surprising about you reacting like this. Yeah, at all. no, it's you know I think my sister's right. You you kind of definitely bottle stuff and put lid on it. And actually, I haven't seen a lot of that footage. Um, what, what kind of man was he? Let's just grab one minute. Yeah, sure. I don't know why. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Everyone will understand. Take as long as you like. Don't worry, we're going to come back hitting after this. It's going to be good. <laughs> <sighs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, and just, you know, being this policeman saying this is what's happened. And just a, a shock, because he'd had a pacemaker fitted a few days before. And I remember going to the hospital, and I'd never seen my dad scared. And I just remember seeing his lower lip wobbling. And I said, I'll come in to the operation with you. And he said, the docs won't let you. And it's the only time I actually showed my sort of SAS card and pulled it and said, I need to be in on that operation. And, you know, it all went good. And we came out, and he was so grateful I was there. And I thought, great. And I went off home. And... Two days later, you know, he was at home recovering and he was in, in bed and bam, you know. It's a while ago now, it's crazy, but it's Are you still very raw. Yeah, you know? I was going to ask you, I mean, do you feel surprised that you've reacted the way you have? Yeah, yeah, I, it's, it's just very raw. I think it's raw. The one that killed me <laughs> is seeing him with me, you know, in the, in the little boat and stuff, yeah. because I do that with my three boys. And it's funny because they look so like him. And so like I did at that age. And it's exactly what I do with them. And I just know he'd be so... He'd love that with them. What, what were the values, do you think, that he instilled in you? Um, he, he just really encouraged me to love something, you know. And when he saw that I loved to climb, do that with him, he really encouraged that. It's why that Everest dream became such a dream of us together. He got me a poster of it. And I'd go, you know, one day I'm going to climb this mountain. It was a real shared dream. Of all the things that you've achieved in your life, what do you think he would have been the proudest of? Um, our boys, and the fact that I'm still married to Shara. Genuinely, you know, I think the other stuff is it's so transient, really. You know, people go, oh, you climbed to the top of this, we serve with that, and you're always much more interested in things like the SAS and Everest than I am, to be honest. You know, it's part of my history, I'm super proud of it, I'm proud of the relationships, but... The pride in my life isn't that stuff. It really isn't, you know. The pride is my family. Come on, bro. Bloody hell. Get a grip, man. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> you dreamed of climbing Everest. Let's talk about Everest, because it was an extraordinary achievement to be the youngest Briton ever to climb uh, that, that remarkable mountain. When you told your parents you were going to do this, I, I can imagine, from what we now know, your dad was like, go for it. Your mum was like, what the hell are you doing there? 
Well, it was a difficult decision for me. It was, it was a difficult decision, I think, especially for my family, because I'd broken my back in this free fall accident like a year earlier that lived through all the stress of me being in this military rehab centre at Headley Court, having to leave the army, being unable to move, being strapped up in braces, doctors not knowing if I was going to be able to walk again properly, and, you know, and, and they'd been through such kind of trauma, really, alongside me, of which I kind of felt guilty about in a way. But for me, I was desperate for that identity again, that this was what I could do, and, and, and I will walk again, I will climb again, I need that focus, and that Everest poster that had been on my bed from such a young age became the whole focus of that recovery. How many of the things you've done adventure-wise has your mother been comfortable with? Well, I think my mum is the unsung hero a lot in these stories, and she's been incredible, you know, huge support, and, you know, she's been through it. And she said to my dad at the time, she said, if you let him go to Everest and he dies, we're over, we're done. I mean, one in six climbers on Everest at that time, in that period, lost their lives. That's a big percentage of people dying on that mountain. You know, we had four climbers lose their lives up there. Two died of the cold, two fell. And you see the harsh, real side of high-altitude mountaineering. And it was ugly and, and frightening and horrible. You know, a lot happened up there. You know, I almost lost my life down a deep crevasse early on in the expedition. I should have been killed by a big avalanche that whisked past us by a fraction, you know. And the truth is, I, I reached that summit by the skin of my teeth and got away with my life where others didn't, but came away very actually humbled and in some ways less confident than I went. You know, I went like going and do this. And I came back thinking, flipping Nora, I've been lucky here. You know, I remember speaking to my dad actually when we got off the very end of it. And he'd gone every faltering step of the way together with me on that mountain. And I knew he'd be, you know, he would have loved to. He did share it with me up there. And one of my great sort of prides in my life is that he was alive to see me do that. And, um, you know, we did it together. I mean, it's a tough thing, isn't it, for someone to call you a cheat? When all this blew up, how did you react to that? <laughs> Let's talk about your wife, Shara. How did you, how did you meet? Um, we met literally a few months before I left for Everest. Uh, it was the worst time in the world to fall in love because I was up in Scotland, it was New Year, I was training, I was staying with a friend, I was climbing every day, I was loading up my backpack with rocks and books and anything, and, you know, climbing 10, 12 hours a day. And she was up there staying with these people. And I did clock her, I thought, she's, she's cool. But I was still focused. And then New Year's Day, I always have a thing. Every New Year, I always skinny dip in the sea. Of course. <laughs> In private. Anyway. Every day you skinny dip. Come on, it's not just New Year's Day. Uh, but the thing is, this was a bad one, because it was north coast of Scotland, January 1st, freezing cold, and I thought, oh, I really don't want to do it, but I'd better keep the tradition going, so I thought I'd do it quick. You know, on our own, on my own on the beach, stripped off, pile of clothes, ran into the sea, freezing. Came out, and my clothes had been washed by this wave, and so I was running around trying to find shoes and socks, and there was one other girl on the beach, she was walking along it, which was Shara, and she kind of saw this ridiculous sight, probably felt sorry for me, this weird man running around looking. <laughs> she came to help me. It was quite cold, I had to stretch a little bit, you know. <laughs> uh, we had, you know, that week or so, and then I went away. And I thought, she's never going to be there when I come back. Amazingly, she was there three months later, and everyone said, don't rush into it when you get back, don't propose too soon. So you did? So I, I kind of got pretty overexcited and we proposed quite quickly. And were you wearing any clothes when you proposed? <laughs> it was funny, cos actually... <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason I, I asked see the question. This, um, this, you know, you, you might get the really. impression I'm naked. This was one of the handful of other times in my life I've been naked, but we were... So you were naked when you proposed to your wife? Well, I was swimming with no clothes on. I pulled out the ring from my butt cheeks. No! <laughs> 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 I, I, had it, I had it nicely palmed. <laughs> and, um, and I remember kneeling on the beach like this. She was standing there going, what are you doing? She was in the towel and a massive Atlantic roller came and I went, will you? And it went, <laughs> took me out of the beach, you know, all the seaweed and I was spinning around. So I tried it again and, um, and in a sort of moment of heavy sedation, she said yes. <laughs> so, yeah. Now, you're a Christian. Have you always been religious or was that something you, you grew into? I had a really natural faith as a kid. You know, I just knew that I was loved and God was there and he was good. 
And then I went to school and suddenly I had to go to chapel and it was all kind of white robes and Latin and, uh, and singing and I thought, oh, I've really got it wrong and I don't know why I thought it was like cosy and, and, and so I threw it totally out and went all the other way and just thought, I don't like this, I don't like the people in the Christian Union particularly, I'm not, this is not my bag. You know? And I remember when I was about 16, um, my godfather, who I was incredibly close to, who's my dad's best friend, died totally out of the blue and I remember being really devastated at 16 on my own. I remember going to climb a tree, as was my kind of default escape. And I remember sitting up the street just saying, oh, I wish you, God, were like when I knew you and as a kid. And will you be with me? Amen. And actually, it's the most powerful prayer. It's the heart of Christianity, really, that, isn't it? And we dress it up in churches and all of this, but actually, that's the heart of it. And, and from that, I began to refine that nice faith I had as a kid. Are you a clean living chap? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I smoke a ton, I used to drink a, a bit and stuff when I left the military and I, I used to chase as many girls as I possibly could, try and get them into bed. How many did you manage to catch? Yes, yeah, sadly, not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you what, it wasn't for lack of trying. <laughs> so it's always been my strength, effort. <laughs> Bear, your television career has put you in the spotlight, but it hasn't always been easy. By the mid-noughties, Bear had established himself as the world's most renowned survival expert. Ugh. But it wasn't just his skills he was putting on display. He cannot keep his clothes on. He's, uh, he's just he's much more at home without clothes on. You'll just be standing around, like four of you standing around in the middle of the Arctic, and then you suddenly realise that he's standing there with his you know, crown jewels in his hands, practically peeing on your boots, just having a normal conversation. Bear's got a scar across his, sort of, by his nipple here on his left. It was him taking the pizza out of the oven, naked, naturally, and burning himself on the, um, on the tray. Clothes on or off, Bear was attracting a huge audience. This is all that's left of an entire pine forest. Amazing. He's just such a natural because he's very um, comfortable with himself. He's really engaging with you know everyone and anyone around him, and so um, and you know and has such an excited way of looking at life. Bear's close-knit filming crew have always had to be on their toes to keep up with his spontaneous antics. It's now deep enough to swim, and being in the river will allow me to cover miles much quicker. Bear's shoots are never really, well, they're never scripted at all. He'll just go off on one. He'll go on some tangents and he'll, he'll run off and go and find something. You could be on location with him and you'll, you'll be filming something and you'll turn around and he'll have like some snake which he's about to bite the head off and you're like, hang on a minute, <laughs> Don't, do we, should we not film this? <laughs> but Bear hit the headlines for the wrong reasons when newspapers accused him of being a cheat. They said instead of sleeping in the wild, he stayed in luxury hotels and misled viewers by stunting up scenes. Look, let's be a realist about it. We're making a TV show. Yeah, you know, he didn't, he's not really surviving. Of course he's not. It's about him showing you how you could survive in that scenario with the certain skills and techniques that he's developed or picked up over the years. Because the whole show was just about him, it was kind of like he was an easy target. With criticism from the public or from the press, it's going to get to you. You know, you wouldn't be human if it didn't get to you to some degree. He felt very hurt. He'd lived in the most god-awful conditions because he genuinely does everything that he does. He did take it incredibly personally. He took the rap very heavily. And I think it did, you know, it upset him a lot. I mean, it's a tough thing, isn't it, for someone to call you a cheat? When all this blew up, how did you react to that? It was definitely hard, you know, I'd, I'd had very little exposure to press stuff, really. I'd done, you know, a few interviews and suddenly it was everywhere and it was like, you know, my, my instinct was to come out and go, no, no, it's not like that, I'll tell you the real story, come with me and come filming and we'll show you and it's, you know, but there, there, was, there was substance to that one allegation at that hotel and I had done that for a night and, you know, I wanted to explain the situation but the situation, you know, they didn't really want the truth, they wanted the headlines. And the truth was, we'd been away filming all over the world and Borneo and Alaska, all these places. And Marmaduke, our middle son, has just been born. So it's eight years ago now. And, um, and suddenly we were filming back in Scotland. And I thought, absolute heaven, brilliant, with the family. So I said to them, come on up. They came up, you know, we spent a night in a B&B &B together. It was brilliant, didn't think anything more of it. And like two years later, you know, I woke up one morning, suddenly, it's, you know, it'd come out. And I really regret that, you know. But 
it's not my first mistake, it's not my last mistake. And I think I had to develop fast, sort of, you know, broad shoulders for this. But it was a baptism by fire into the negative media side. Let's go over some of the allegations that were made, and you can respond to them how you want to. A, mu a wild Mustang you lassoed in the Sierra Nevada mountain range in California was in fact a tame animal from a nearby trekking centre. Was that true? Yeah, I mean, there were... No. <laughs> but there were all these other allegations. But the one that was true was I spent this night with Jean and the family in Scotland, you know, so and on, on the on back that, of that... on the wild Mustang, that... No, so they were wild horses, or what we'd come across as wild horses, and then the journalists go and they dig and they find some local and they go, have you seen these horses? And he goes, oh, they're wild... These, those aren't wild horses up there, they're all ex-ranch horses, and great ex-ranch horses, and... Could you know, they have been ex-ranch horses? Yeah, they probably were ex-ranch right. horses, but I didn't know. I'm seeing horses on the hillside and they're, you know, as far as I'm concerned, they're wild. But there was always stuff like this. And, you know, then they said, we stayed in this other hotel, but actually, we had stayed in the hotel, we weren't filming. If you had your time again, and you, you know now how it all played out and everything, would you do it differently? Yeah, for sure. You know, I would have two, two things differently. One, I wouldn't have stayed in that B&B in Scotland with the family. Heaven as it was to stay with them, I would have been smart and go, that's going to come back to haunt you. Wish it did. And secondly, I would have done what they did after all of this scandal, which was Discovery and Channel 4 put a disclaimer at the front saying, don't do anything of this at home. You know, scenes are presented to bear to show you how to stay alive. And I think the best response always is to get back out there, get back on that you know, saddle <laughs> of the ranch horse. <laughs> I'm big enough and ugly enough now to realise, you know, that's just part of it. Don't mm. take it so personally. And, you know, you see it with clearer eyes eight years on. How rich are you? <laughs> um, we've been super lucky and I never I take it for... I never take so it for granted. Let's translate luck into pounds. You've had eight TV series now, you've written 15 books, had your own range of clothing and survival equipment, and you've become a global brand. How rich are you? <laughs> um, we've been super lucky, and I never I take it for... I never take so it for granted. Let's translate luck into pounds. No, I think, I think that's How not for... How lucky have you been? <laughs> um, I'm not a sort of person who counts, and I really mean that. I don't, I'm not I like that. you know exactly how much money you've got. Well, you'd, you'd be wrong, actually. Really? Yeah, really, genuinely. I Is that because you've got so much you just can't keep up with it? <laughs> well, it's great not to have to worry about paying the bills and, and you know, I don't have to worry well, about money. Wealth has so been that's... estimated at around £6 million. Pounds. I suspect it's a lot higher. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't count. I don't... Are I'm... we at the 5, 10, 15, <laughs> 20 or 100 mark? Ballpark. I don't know. I'd like to think it's, it's the upper end of, of the things. Um, but I what, don't... A hundred? I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't kind of... Um... Oh, wait a minute. Seriously, a hundred million pounds? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I genuinely... Yeah, but you know, know it's a lot more than I was saying. It's, yeah, it's pro it is probably more than you're saying. Between but... 50 and 100? No, I'd say less than 50. But above 40? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> and I'm not going to deny and say we haven't been... You know, I've been so blessed like that. What is the most extravagant thing you bought yourself with all this cash? I'm always spending money and far too much art on boats, on like ribs and new jet skis and parachutes. And I'm, our barn is just piled high with paragliders and I love to get the latest one I've had. And, you know, it's ridiculous, really. And Shara goes, I found this really nice dress. And I'm going, really? <laughs> she goes, you just bought four parachutes, two jet... <laughs> I go, mm, how much the dress? <laughs> I, I actually, the truth is now, I'm always trying to get her to buy it. And I say, go on, just buy it. It's fine. She goes, oh, what is it? I could just buy the goddamn dress. It's fine. <laughs> Fair, you're a man who likes to be prepared for any challenge that comes your way. The clean cut family man with a sense of adventure was about to become a role model for a new generation. When Bear comes along, I reckon the scouting organisation must just have thought this is our lucky day. In 2009, at the age of 34, Bear became the youngest ever chief scout. He's a real believer in people getting off their chairs and getting outside and doing things and working together in teams. There's something about him which, which a child connects to, too. There's just that genuine excitement that he has. Nowadays, more than anything, what the world really needs is good role models, and Bear is one, probably the best. When we take Bear around the movement, I wasn't quite prepared for 
for the welcome that, that Bear was going to get. It's full on, and I, and I think even Bear was um, surprised at uh, his impact. On top of 35 million scouts worldwide, Bear has his own little clan of three Bear Cubs to lead. If you were a kid and you wanted to, what sort of dad do you want? Someone I like, someone can take me camping, fishing, hunting. He's the dad. I mean, it might get a bit tricky when they become teenagers and they're like <laughs> rebelling against him. He's just so sweet with our boys. I mean, he's the most affectionate person ever. His adventurous sons are following in dad's footsteps. The three boys, they're not wallflowers, you know? They're, they're, they're boisterous boys, um, as you'd imagine, from the spawn of the grills. But having just turned 40, is it time for Bear to hang up his boots? Every year he says, this year I'm not going to do as much, I'm going to wind it down, I'm going to retire by the, I'm the age of when it was 40, I'm going to retire by the age of 43, whatever. Every year it just gets busier and busier and busier because he just loves it, absolutely loves what he does. He would like to replace Daniel Craig as James Bond. Just getting it out there, that is absolutely true. That's what he would like to do. That would be his ultimate dream. I know he wants to go into space. I don't want him to go into space. I've said that with every expedition. <laughs> and he's done it anyway, so he won't take any notice of what I say anyway. <laughs> Shara must be a very special lady to, I wouldn't say put up, but to, to go through all the stuff that you do. It's a precarious existence for a spouse. Yeah, completely. And I think when you get married, you don't actually know somebody that well. I knew I, I loved her. She's amazing. But, you know, after 14 years of marriage, then you know what someone's like. And she is incredible. She's the most wonderful mother. She's loyal. She's kind. She's fun. She's always there for me. She's never dazzled by the, the, the kind of unimportant stuff. And really, genuine for me is the sort of reason for coming home. Always a... Look, she's gone. <laughs> 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 She's amazing. <laughs> See that? That would be her idea of a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> what about space? I mean, are you serious about going to space? Well, I'm, I'm going to space with Virgin Galactic and Land Rover next year, so that's something we are doing. I keep trying to tell Shara, it's not kind of totally out of space, we're just flying in the atmosphere and doing our bit, so it'll be fine, trust me. Yeah, but it is actually in space. Yeah, it is in space, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're still in negotiation phase, Shara and me, at that, but she often starts off with, like, no, and then it just takes a little bit of gentle persuasion. You were approached to become Chief Scout. That must have been a pretty proud moment for you, because you're the ultimate Boy Scout, really, aren't you? Well, it's still my proudest, you know, thing, position I hold, and I love it, you know, it's... There are 40 million scouts now around the world, and the more scouts I meet, the more I get inspired. And they're kids from the toughest areas of the UK out there, proud, living their adventures with values and determination and smiles on their face. And you think, what a shining light. You turned 40 earlier this year. You're looking pretty good on it, I have to say. But how long can you realistically continue being an action man with all your faculties that that requires? Well, it definitely gets harder as the years go on. I, I, I hurt more and old injuries like my back hurt more and all of this and you get more scars and, you know. But I love this quote that says, I don't want to arrive at the end of my life in a perfectly preserved body. I want to come screaming <laughs> sideways, covered in scars, battered, bruised, but screaming, Yahoo, <laughs> what a ride. <laughs> Your three boys, they're boisterous, we know that. They're probably all mini bears. If one of them really did want to be the next Bear Grylls, would you encourage them, or would you, as a parent, a father, feel slightly concerned about that? Well, they've got more sense than me. They're, they're smart boys, and, you know, my dad always used to say to me, you've got to follow your dreams and look after your friends along the way, and that was life in a nutshell for him. Um, and I try and say the same things to them. It's just they're not allowed to climb Everest with the one or six yards they're coming home. <laughs> but I want to say to my kids, go for it, you know? Final question, Bert. If you could give me one survival tip, if I was stuck on a desert island, what would it be? Depend on the fire inside, you know, because we all have it. And sometimes in life it gets covered over by dust and we don't visit very often. But the truth is, as humans, when we're pushed, we're strong. And 
Don't be scared to visit that fire. Don't be scared to depend on that fire because it's, it's God-given in each of us and it will keep you alive and it's stronger than you think. And go for it. Very <laughs> grills. Thank you. It's the last round of auditions this weekend ahead of boot camp. The X Factor continues tomorrow and Sunday night at 8. Then at 9.20 tomorrow, ask who lives in a house like this and why let Keith Lemon in it. It's through the keyhole. And on Sunday at 9, we're back with Downton Abbey as our drama finally returns to your screens. Next, though, it's the news at 10.